welcome everybody um, to the first talk of, of, the, of the week. Um, today we have Mehran Akada from my team, who's been in the program right from the start. So, uh, and he's going to tell us about uh, the immune system and statistical physics. Mehran, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tani. And uh... It's been fun to be in this program for the past uh, five or six months. So thank you very much for organizing it. So I gave a kind of generic title, which is a, a combination of things that we have been doing on the immune system with Arup Chakra Party over the past uh, 15 years or so. Uh, but then I gave a version of this talk uh, a uh, couple months or so ago at the Cavendish, and then I realized I have put too many things together. So I have I've decided to uh, only focus on part of this talk that has to do with the uh, uh, the T cell component of the immune system. I'm actually later on giving another talk uh, in the bio launch that I will focus on the B cell component. So. Uh, uh, let's start with some introduction to the adaptive immune system. And as I said, since I'm only giving half of the talk, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. It's more important that we get a few things right. Uh, so uh, the adaptive immune system uh, evolved roughly half a billion years ago in some uh, jawed fish, and now the mammals have it. And it's a uh, part of the immune system that recognizes uh, particular pathogens and uh, has the memory uh, to uh, uh, later on uh, recognize and respond to them. Okay, this is better. And uh, there are two arms of uh, the adaptive immune system. There's the T cell component and there's a B cell component. And roughly how they work is uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. So imagine that you have a virus that comes and uh, uh, infects a host cell, and then it starts to reproduce itself, and that's the infection. And then the way that uh, the body responds is two ways. There are B cells, and there are receptors on the surface of B cells that can be released and uh, bind uh, to the component of the virus that is necessary for it to infect the host cell and inactivate it. Uh, so essentially virus particles that are outside the cell are uh, inactivated by the uh, B cell component, uh, but the cell itself is infected and keeps reproducing them. So the component of the immune system that destroys the uh, infected cells are the T cells. And the way that it works is that uh, any cell presents on its surface fragments of proteins that are inside. And uh, then there are the T cells that come and inspect the cells for the fragments that it is presenting. And if they see that it's a foreign component that is presented and they decide that uh, this host cell is infected, then they change the program that causes them to become killer cells and go ahead and uh, destroy the infected cell. So the B cells destroy through the antibodies, the particles that are outside the cell and T cells uh, get rid of uh, the infected cells. And uh, these, both of these components, the antibodies that are released by the B cells and the T cells that have been activated by some uh, foreign uh, peptide that is presented, essentially remember this infection and uh, they are around to uh, prevent uh, future infections. Okay. So the viruses, we've all heard now from Corona about the uh, spike of the virus, right? 
So the spike of the virus is like a key for, that the virus has that binds to specific receptors on the surface of the cell that have various functions that the cell has to do. Essentially, they bind to the receptor and like a key, open up the cell and then send their uh, uh, genetic component inside the cell. Now, so this is really a key, these spikes that the viruses have. Now, what the receptors of the antibodies do, they essentially are complements that bind to this key. And essentially then the virus does not have the key to enter it. So these are sort of, uh, the antibodies are working at the level of these uh, 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 small spikes that are the keys. Anything else? Okay. Now, as I said, for this talk, I'm going to focus on T cells. And just the, this is supposed to be a picture of a T cell that has come in contact with a, a cell that is potentially infected and is uh, presenting antigens. Antigens are the things that antibodies potentially bind to. So what is happening? So within all of the cells, there are proteins that are constantly being made for the cell to function. If there is a virus that comes, it also makes its own proteins. So there is a lot of proteins that are inside the cell, but there's always a machinery inside the cell that once the proteins are past some expiration date, they cut them into pieces. There's something called the protease, uh, protease that uh, has the job of taking this protein that is a long chain and cutting it up into fragments that we will call peptides. These peptides are typically of the order of uh, 10 amino acids long. And then there's another machinery there is a particular molecule that is called MHC for major histocompatibility complex. And the job of the MHC is to grab onto these peptides. You can think of it as a bowl that has grabbed out the piece of peptide and goes outside the cell and presents it to the outside world. Just yes. Just Protein of the peptides. Right. Is, is the only role of the peptides involved in the MHC, or are they, do they also have functional roles in terms of building blood Exactly. Exactly. So, this is essentially a way of the cell uh, to have the materials in order to sort of make future proteins. Yes. Uh, once you have picked it, uh, uh, made it into pieces of, I mean, as long as you go from the, this piece to amino acids, no, no, then you're, yes, yes. Right, so there's presumably another machinery that would cut them further, but that's, right, right, yes. So there is actually, um, well, there's a whole other story about that. <laughs> Uh, all right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. They're lost. They're You're getting rid of them. The ones that come to the surface? Yeah. No, they're sitting on the molecules, the MIC molecules. Okay, so and... it's not like... no. no, 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 no. So they are presenting them, uh, and actually, uh, the person who discovered this and they said, okay, essentially then the role of the T cell is to come and inspect these and decide whether they are self or foreign. Uh, it was kind of the community didn't like it because they said, well, is the immune system working on the garbage that is uh, the cell is disposing? But essentially it's something like that. Yeah, so basically uh, then the T cell comes and the T cell has its own receptor, which is complement to this MHC molecule and potentially the peptide that is presented. And based on the interaction here, they have to decide whether it's a cell or foreign. Uh, 
Yes. I don't know that number. That is how many molecules. There's actually another story that it's not a single type of MHC. There are a number of MHC variants. And each one of us has uh, some combination of our MHC. And this histocompatibility complex is because of the problems of transplantation or because if you transplant some other tissue, then it potentially is representing different MHC molecules and the T cells get confused. But I don't know what that number is, how many things are covering the cell for uh, Okay. And uh, so basically, as I said, the, the job of the T cell is to come and uh, uh, inspect the MHC that are presented, and maybe a few of them are presenting things that are not part of the cell, but are because of the cell having been infected, and they have to recognize that and give the future signals that the T cell has to change uh, character and uh, destroy this, uh, this uh, infected cell. So the only thing that you have here in order to distinguish between self and foreign is the binding energy of this T cell receptor and uh, this peptide MHC complex. Okay. Now, what is this uh, uh, innovation that I said evolved uh, half a billion years ago and uh, uh, allows uh, mammals to have this adaptive immune system? The innovation is that the receptors that lie on the surfaces of T cells and B cells are all individual to that T cell uh, clone. And there are a huge number of them. So typically our understanding is that uh, we have every cell in our body carries the same DNA. Now, depending on whether it's a heart cell or a liver cell, some proteins that are part of that genetic component are uh, uh, being uh, produced and some are not. So that's the distinction that we have between the different cells. But the idea is that all of the cells would have the same genetic component. That is not correct for the immune cells because each immune cell that is created initially inside the bone marrow uh, essentially also carries its own DNA for the receptors. And the way that that happens is that essentially the DNA for the receptors is uh, created by a kind of combinatoric process. That is the germline has a number of uh, uh, pieces that are called V, a number of pieces that are called B, a number of pieces that are called J. And there is some uh, random selection of uh, the VDJ component uh, that combine to make what the uh, receptor of that particular uh, uh, T cell or B cell is going to be. Uh, there is a lot of uh, work that people have done, uh, including uh, uh, the group of uh, Alexandra Balchak on what the combinatorics here is, et cetera. And uh, the claim is that uh, uh, the number of possible uh, combinations, once you also add deletions and uh, insertions, et cetera, can create of the order of 10 to the 12 possible permutations of these things. Yes. Yes. Well, that's uh, actually part of the uh, work of Alexandra Volchek yeah, and company. Right. Yes. So what they do is uh, uh, they essentially create a table of probabilities uh, based on the knowledge of uh, the kinds of uh, uh, receptors that are presented. They sort of have a step-by-step -step, uh, table as to the first step, the second step, etc. So it's uh, 
following some program of uh, stochasticity that we can assign probabilities to. No, no, As, yes, yes, but, but it's not just, <laughs> there is some rules for that, <laughs> but not external processes, no. Okay, okay, so the, the, the issue then is the following, that if independent of, as you say, external conditions, uh, you generate these many possibilities, and why do you do that? Because you think that some of the randomly generated ones are going to potentially be good to bind to some piece of an infection that you've never seen before in your life. Like the, car, the SARS uh, uh, virus that came, our body had not seen before, but we were able to find appropriate antibodies to that. So the solution uh, for the immune system is to create a huge random selection of possibilities and hope that some of them are okay for these things that we've never seen before. But then the problem is, well, if you randomly generate these things, and the only thing that you can do to make a distinction is uh, binding to a peptide for the T cell, why won't you create uh, uh, things, receptors that would bind to your own peptides, that should be very likely. And when that happens, you would uh, make the mistake of thinking that this is a foreign and you create autoimmune diseases, which do happen. So you have to solve uh, somehow simultaneously a number of problems, including you have to create a, a set of receptors that are self-tolerant, yet they are diverse enough to be able to recognize things that you haven't seen, and also specific, so that once you recognize to something, then you, you remember that for future, you have the key for that. Okay. So part of that story for the T cells is what happens in the thymus. So as I mentioned, in the bone marrow, you create a whole bunch of different candidate uh, uh, T cells, B cells. I won't talk about the B cells, but the T cells, before they are released into uh, the tissue to do their job, they go through a process that is called thymic selection. So there is this organ thymus, that we have, and the T cells, before they go and do their job, they are randomly generated, they go to the thymus, and they are tested whether they are good to do their task. Now, as I said, in most tissues, uh, there are certain proteins that are uh, uh, generated, some proteins that are not useful are not generated. What is special about the thymus is that there are certain uh, signals that are going on for the cells of the thymus that essentially they create all proteins of the body and then all proteins of the body are chopped up into pieces as we have discussed. So the cells in the thymus are presenting peptides taken from all possible tissues of the body. So that's special about the thymus. And then the T cells that were randomly generated before they become T cells, they're actually called thymocytes. These thymocytes go into the thymus and they undergo two tests. One test that is kind of obvious is called negative selection. So if these randomly generated thymocytes, the receptors bind uh, strongly to the peptides that are presented by the cells of the thymus, then they are eliminated to the first goal. Why they are eliminated? Because clearly these are the things that if they were in the tissue, they would bind uh, the uh, peptides of the tissue that are self and would cause autoimmune disease. What about autoimmune diseases? 
I will come to that, but you can already see what is going to happen is that there is this thymocyte that is in the thymus. It moves around and samples things. And if it samples something uh, uh, binds you too strongly, it gets eliminated. But it's a random process. How can you ensure that it will see every single one? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you have to decide that you either wait for eternity for it to find everybody, or you say, okay, it has sampled enough, let it go. Okay. So there is another uh, complement to this that is called the uh, more or less, but to, to, the, to a large extent, uh, it happens when we are young. Yeah. And the time was kind of shrinks as we. Okay. And then there is uh, this uh, complement, the positive selection. That is, uh, there is also no signal for this thymocyte to survive, even if it, do if it doesn't bind anybody. So it has to bind at least uh, one or two of the things that are presented, but with a kind of weaker threshold. So there is two thresholds. There is the threshold that if you bind uh, uh, too strongly, you are eliminated. There is another threshold that you have to at least bind something a little bit to be selected, because otherwise maybe it's a kind of uh, uh, thymocyte that would not be, be, uh, bind to anything. And so it would be useless to have it uh, have that cloner. Okay, so that's the process. And uh, as I said, repeated thymocytes come. In the thymus, they are presented to peptides, uh, which they would die uh, unless there is this positive selection. And they would certainly die if there's negative selection. And uh, the ones that uh, survive this uh, uh, are mature T cells. OK, so a while ago, we made a model for this process. And uh, the model is very simple. We assume that uh, this MHC molecule is like a bowl. The peptides is something that is a sequence of a certain number of amino acids. I'll call that number that we allow to vary capital N. Typically, as I said, it is somewhere between five and 10 amino acids now. And uh, the T cell receptor is a more complicated object that is created through this combinatoric process. But there is a part of it that is responsible for the bindings, et cetera, uh, that I will call the T cell receptor. And it is also another uh, string of amino acids. Part of the assumption of the model is that these two strings of amino acids come and lie next to each other so that I can compute an energy as a sum of pairwise interaction energies. So that's an approximation. And so that's the formula, the pairwise interaction energies uh, between amino acids on one side and amino acids on the other side. And there are these uh, well-known matrices of interactions that one can use, although they are approximations and one should not take these things very seriously. Okay, so uh, is the model clear enough? Okay, so based on this model, uh, we compute uh, uh, interaction energies between a particular uh, thymocyte that has been randomly generated. So we assume that the amino acids are according to the frequencies of amino acids in the human body. And uh, then we present it to a panel of uh, uh, possible self-peptides and compute the interaction energies. If the interaction energies are too weak always, we eliminate that. If one of the interaction energies exceeds the other threshold, it's binding too strongly, we eliminate that. So there's only some fraction that survive 
that have the interaction energies in the right range. Okay. And this is done for a panel. Another important number is how many self-peptides do I see in the thymus? That number we call M is of the order of several thousand to 10,000. Okay. All right. So what is plotted here is, yes. 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 Uh, that number is, uh, has a range that is known and is slightly different for different people and people who are maybe more autoimmune uh, sensitive have fewer of that number, but it is in that range of 10 to the four. Yes. Okay. So what is plotted here is uh, the frequencies of various amino acids. There are 20 possible amino acids and they are listed here. It doesn't matter what they are. <laughs> but the point is that the ones that are on the left are the ones that are more hydrophobic and bind more strongly. They have larger values in this MJ matrix. The ones that are on the other side are kind of weaker binders. They uh, have smaller energies in this uh, uh, matrix. And what is plotted on the y-axis is the ratio of uh, how many, uh, the fraction of amino acids that was presented before selection to how many survived after selection. And the different colors correspond to shifting this value of M that we said for healthy people is in this range of 10,000. Okay. What we find is that if M is small, you tend to select amino acids that are strongly binding because it's important for you to pass the first positive selection threshold. As the number becomes larger and larger, the chances are that you have passed that threshold, then what is uh, uh, limiting is the chance that you would pass the higher negative threshold. So you tend to make things that are uh, enhanced in the weaker amino acids. So basically, our uh, uh, model, and it doesn't really matter what matrix we use, says that uh, essentially when you have a large number that you have to select against, you tend to uh, select mostly weakly binding amino acids. There's one important consequence of that, which is that the way that specificity is now made up is you, if you have a bunch of weak amino acids in order to pass a threshold, you have to find the best complements to those weak amino acids. And that's what makes it specific because now if you change one of the weak amino acids, then you would have to find a different combination. And uh, so what we find is that somehow this requirement that we made for tolerance according to self builds into it some information about how specificity is made, okay? Now, how would you test that? Well, you would say that if you somehow went to the other limit for M was small, and then you would have uh, essentially an enhancement in the number of uh, strongly binding amino acids, then it would be less specific because uh, let's say among your eight sites, there are three sites that bind strongly and those strong binds are enough to take you above the threshold, then it doesn't really matter what you do with the other five. So there's lots of uh, mutations that you can do to the peptide that you have recognized that you would continue to recognize if you were in this condition. And that's precisely what they did for mice. So uh, our colleague, uh, Eric Husby, 
can generate uh, some kind of a mice that in their immune system only present a few of these uh, uh, self-peptides. They can do that. Somehow these mice live. And then you can ask if uh, the uh, TCRs, the T cells of these mice, are recognizing some particular uh, peptide, uh, how easy is it to mutate that peptide? They, what they find is precisely that there are a couple of hot spots that if you mutate, then everything breaks down. But there are lots of other sites that are not hot spots that you can mutate, and everything continues to be fine. Okay. So there is uh, a, a related work that uh, um, my student uh, Andre uh, Koshmerlik and Arup Ar Ar Chakrabarty did, where uh, there is this story that uh, HIV is very difficult to control, of course, because the HIV uh, virus mutates very rapidly. And so you have maybe T cells that recognize some peptide of HIV and can eliminate the infected cells. But if the HIV is able to mutate, then the T cells cannot do their job. So you would imagine that if the patients of HIV were somehow more like mice, they would be able to control uh, 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 this uh, mutating virus more. And so indeed, there are some cohort of patients that are called elite controllers. And elite controllers uh, are known to be able to control more variants of uh, HIV virus. And so when they looked at the immune system of these people, they found that uh, they had variant of the MHC molecule that was presenting fewer of these uh, self-peptides in the thymus. So there was some kind of a correlation between that. Okay. So typically when I give the talk, at this point, I go on to the next thing. But since this is a workshop about uh, statistical physics and mathematics, I will do the mathematical derivations here because it turns out that this model that we presented is also a very nice, exactly solvable model of statistical physics to generate these probabilities that we have over here. Okay, so how do we do that? The first step to that is to recognize that the timing selection process is an extreme value problem. Because I said that uh, we have a panel of impossible energies that are selected, and the conditions for positive selection and negative selection are really relevant to the extreme, the most uh, strong binding. So I don't care about any others I, if I focus on the extreme. And all I want is that the extreme fall in between the two uh, energies that I have given. If it is on one side or the other side, that uh, T cell has been uh, eliminated. So the probability of uh, selection of a thymocyte is that the maximum of M uh, encounters lie in some range of energies. Now, extreme value th uh, theory tells you that the maximum, no, no, because look at this one. It has been selected. This is the first one, and this is the second one. You don't get it. Okay, I mean, what I'm talking about is the model which was implemented on the computer. So for the model, it is only the one. Yes, so we can change the model and then discuss how things would change. But for the model, this is it. Yeah. The second. Right. Right, yeah. 
okay? And now, what is interesting about the extremum is that, well, first of all, the position of the extremum gets shifted by the number of selections that you make. And so I can calculate the average value of this uh, uh, matrix, uh, but the location of the mean of the extremum is shifted from the average value by an amount that is proportional to the square root of twice the log of the number of things that you select against. So this is the standard. And the coefficient there is actually the variance in the energy. So the more variance you have, you can sort of push to further values for your extremum. And this is well-known formulas. Yes. I'm kind of assuming that, yes, yes. Right, yeah, right. So I'm not thinking in terms of pressure or other dis distributions, yes, yeah. But that's, that's something that one can worry about. So if, and indeed one of the things that I kind of will work on later on is I said we are dealing with a sequence of amino acids that is typically seven or eight long. I call that number N. But for my exact results to hold, this n has to be infinity. So I have to be able to take n going to infinity. And I will, you will ask me why that is correct. And I will show you later. Okay. So this is the shift in the mean of the extreme. The other thing that is interesting is that the variance of the extreme also goes down by an amount that is square root of 2 log n. Now, suppose that as a statistical physicist, I want to take n going to infinity. Then uh, the variance of the extremum will become order of one if log m is order of n, because this is a sum of n terms. If log m is of the order of n, then this is something that is order of one. And also that's nice because then the location of the mean shifts by order of n, because this is a square root of order of n times order of n. Okay. And there is a justification for why, if you were to look at larger and larger immune systems, you would need to choose n to be of the order of the square root of uh, 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 log m. And the reason for that is uh, the size of the uh, proteome essentially grows if you have larger and larger genomes. And if you want to be able to identify sufficient pieces of the genome, you need to make uh, uh, the n number to be logarithmically large. Again. If n is equal to one, you can distinguish between two amino acids. n equals to two, you can label 20 squared. n equals to three, 20 cubed. And so essentially, uh, you choose n such that 20 to the n is of the order of your size of the proteome. And that would be the minimal number so that you can tag all possible uh, things. So there's a justification to have some relationship that is logarithmic between M and M. Okay, so that's what we assume. Then my claim is that uh, uh, this becomes a solvable problem of statistical physics. So let me just go to table here. Just uh, Repeat, so the energy for one peptide that is a sequence of amino acids, and given some corresponding uh, uh, peptide from, uh, that it is trying to bind to, is the sum over n terms, which are uh, the, interaction matrix between them. And the claim that I have made is that if I take 
the max of uh, this with respect to M choices of the peptides, that the location of this max is simply sum of uh, the average of K for that. So basically I go for that particular peptide of the T cell, there is a column of values of uh, MJ matrix and I calculate what that average is. And uh, then there's a shift, which is the square root of root log M. And then there's a sum of the variances of that element of that matrix. So this is the variance, okay? And again, I claim this is like a Hamiltonian that is acting on these T cells that are presented. And the condition that I have is that I will select a particular T cell is if this Hamiltonian lies between a positive and a negative uh, interaction threshold. Okay. So this is kind of like a canonical ensemble. And I would like to say that there is a corresponding, sorry, micro canonical ensemble. I want to go to a canonical ensemble. So typically what we do, we would say, okay, there is entropy that is a function of if this I call this energy. And there's presumably a minimum value because this is a discrete system like an Ising model. And then as I go above that minimum value, uh, the number of uh, uh, possible states that I can give to some particular energy large, goes larger. Then I have some interval between the two energies. And then statistical physics tells us that essentially in the limit of large n, it doesn't matter what the interval is, everything is going to be dominated by here. You can calculate some kind of a slope here and say that this uh, weight, the probability that the P's are selected or not, which was previously, whether they are this interval or outside that interval is actually in the large end limit is equivalent to the canonical uh, ensemble. Now, the only thing to worry about here is that this system not only has a minimum energy, but also a maximum energy. And depending on where you put your interval, you can end up with things that correspond to positive beta or negative beta, right? Like the Ising model. And in particular, if you choose your thing to find, fall right at the maximum, beta equals to zero is also a possibility, okay? So that would be fine, but how can I solve uh, for the entropy of this system? And the reason it's not trivial is because of this factor, okay? Because imagine that you were trying to solve an Ising model. You had a term that was something like sum over I sigma I. Say, okay, that's fine to solve. But what if you had a term that was of the order of sum over I sigma I with the square root? Because this corresponds to some interactions among the different things, right? So it's kind of actually this Hamiltonian looks to be uh, like a uh, interacting system. And you would say, oh, how do I do that? But the point is that really the energy is a function of two macroscopic quantities. One of them is the mean 
and the other is the variance. All right? So I can really plot the entropy as a function of two variables, M and N, M and V, that are macroscopic. And then my interval would correspond to some range of things in the M uh, V space. And the thing is that both M and V are extensive quantities. So the same trick can show you that the answer is going to be proportional to a product measure that involves two different versions of the temperature, angling on the mean and the variance. And since these are additive, this is a product measure. It involves the mean of J of Ti and the mean of they are square of mm -hmm. So I guess let's subtract out the mean square. Uh, here I wrote down as the energy, but once I do it as a function of the two, there is a constraint between the sum of the two that corresponds to the, the overall energy. And the point is that you can calculate the entropy for this product measure easily. And then you have it over here, and you can calculate uh, uh, essentially the probability once you have calculated beta and gamma uh, immediately in terms of uh, properties of the MJ matrix. And so this essentially is telling you about that. And uh, one can sort of construct this kind of phase diagram where uh, essentially by going along the vertical axis here, I am increasing the value of M. Uh, as the value of M increases, I go to cases that correspond to a uh, selection that corresponds to beta positive, strong amino acids, then I go to the regime that corresponds to beta negative. Uh, and so essentially that thing that we had before, one can sort of uh, go through here. There is a range where beta equals to zero because of having a finite interval. As the difference between the two goes to zero, that size that vanishes. Okay. So you say all of this is nice statistical physics and n going to infinity. Uh, what does it mean? Well, the red curve is the result of the calculation for n going to infinity. And the dots and the black correspond to actual calculation using the model done on the computer for n of five. Seem to work nicely. <laughs> so, so that's a cover of statistical physics for you for n of five. <laughs> okay, any questions on that? Everybody asks me that, and I don't know the full answer. One guess that I have is that the number of state variables at each side that I have is 20 amino acids. Maybe 20 is already a big enough number, and that's part of the story, but we haven't really done a one over n correction. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so now a different story. Uh, as we discussed, the way that these uh, thymocytes are moving in the thymus and get negatively selected is essentially a random walk where you sort of go in three-dimensional space, you have encounters, and at some point you have to say, okay, enough. I have had maybe of the order of 10,000 encounters, let me go outside. But that uh, is uh, not going to be uh, exhaustive. So there have to be a number of uh, T cells that are self-reactive. 
And in reality, this number is may, maybe between one third, two thirds of the uh, T cells that come out of the thymus are potentially self-reactive. So how does one deal with that? Okay, so here's uh, another calculation that we did a while ago. Uh, this is the, the following. If you uh, take a random probability distribution and make uh, M uh, selections from it, and then you say, okay, I want to choose a particular value of threshold such that after making M selections, uh, all of the M selections are below that threshold so that they would be, for example, negative. Uh, it's an interesting calculation to show that essentially you will push this location of the threshold such that if you integrate above that threshold, you get one over M plus one, I guess. Uh, Kiran says, of course, obvious. It wasn't obvious to me. I had to do the calculation. <laughs> okay. So if we say that uh, uh, of the order of 10 to the four uh, uh, different things I have to see in the thymus, then the probability that uh, the time uh, the T cell receptor that has come out makes a random connection and it exceeds the threshold which is really the same thing as you have for activation threshold, uh, then you would say that typically a T cell that uh, has undergone selection, if we present it a random peptide, the, the chance that it would uh, bind to it is 10 to the minus four, okay? So clearly you cannot make the decision on the basis of some one particular peptide, and you have essentially a huge number of different peptides, uh, the total number in the body could be as large as 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 different clones of a cell, but we are really now going to be focusing on a particular tissue where uh, some kind of uh, uh, autoimmune could potentially occur and uh, choose some kind of a number like uh, uh, 40,000, which is reasonable for the number of distinct T cells in that tissue. So you would say that uh, of the order of uh, 40,000 uh, T cells, probability is uh, 10 to the minus four. Four of them would recognize uh, uh, a, a, a particular uh, peptide. But there should be a difference between recognizing a peptide that is foreign and a peptide that is self. And that difference comes because you already went through this uh, selection. So some fraction of the peptides that are self, you have already been, you have potentially seen. And if you were, saw that, you, uh, you were uh, uh, eliminated. So because of that difference between what you have seen in the thymus and foreign peptides that you haven't seen, there is a difference between probabilities to react to self and probabilities to react to peptide that are uh, modified by this ratio that is a fraction that you saw in the, uh, in the thymus. And so let's choose Again, the numbers are somewhat arbitrary, just to give you the concept. Uh, some value of uh, M over P, such that the difference between uh, recognizing a foreign being 10 to the minus four, recognizing self, it is uh, smaller by 30%. Okay. So you would say that if of your 40,000, four of them would recognize the foreign peptides, uh, let's say 1.2 of them would uh, then uh, interact with self, and that's not good because then you have uh, out of these 40,000, some of them, one or two of them could potentially generate uh, autoimmunity. So in 2013, uh, we had uh, an excellent postdoc, Tom Butler, 
who suggested that one solution to this is that the decision to mount an autoimmune disease is not made by a single peptide recognizing something, but by some quorum of uh, pep uh, by some quorum of T cells that may or may not recognize and collectively make this decision. And so this picture is supposed to indicate what's going on. Uh, that is, you have a collection of T cells in the tissue. Uh, they encounter a self-peptide or a foreign peptide. And the difference in probabilities that I mentioned means that there are more of uh, the foreign peptides given compared to self. Now, the point is that once you decide on a quorum, then you can take the initial two probabilities and separate them out widely. So if I assume that, for example, a quorum value is 10, and these selections are made uh, uh, randomly according to probabilities P, S, and P that are slightly different, once I raise them to the quorum uh, expectation, assuming Poisson distribution, we can sort of separate out the probabilities that were different by a factor of three to some things that is of the order of uh, 10,000 different. Okay. So our suggestion was that there is some kind of a quorum going on. And in the last couple of years, there is now consensus that is building that that is the case. So for example, there is this recent experiment that was done by the group of Neil Friedman where uh, they had uh, essentially different wells in which they had uh, uh, T cells and uh, peptides. And they could see that essentially there would be an appropriate decision change for the collection of uh, uh, T cells between one type of behavior and another type of behavior dependent on the number of uh, individual T cells that were activated. Yes. Each T cell is responding to a single peptide. So there is a difference between that. It is, I call, we call it quorum sensing because it is more similar to uh, essentially groups of cells uh, responding together. And then you need some kind of a mechanism for that. And the mechanism for that is that uh, uh, T cells uh, release and consume cytokines. And essentially, uh, uh, the concentration of the cytokines could then be the corresponding signal that you, you need to go through this. Okay. And then there is a more recent work, again, by the, including the group of Alexandra Valchuk and Terry Mora, uh, that showed that there is some information theoretic way of their looking at the sequence of possible T-cell receptors as to why a single T-cell receptor by itself can never distinguish self and foreign, and you must have a quorum of them. So there's essentially, as I said, a, a, a something that is building on that. So very recently, so I should really also talk about something that we are doing currently, uh, but, I don't have time for that. <laughs> so what, what I will tell you is that in recent work, we addressed the following question, that essentially it turns out that the onset of autoimmune diseases such as diabetes and MS are very strongly correlated with a viral infection. That is in order to get diabetes, this is the difference between those that were not uh, 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 exposed to a virus and those that were exposed to the virus that's called enterovirus. And similar thing for MS and uh, a different virus uh, that's the Epstein-Barr virus. And you practically need to have the exposure to Epstein-Barr virus in order to get MS. And so we sort of went through our uh, uh, construction with the uh, uh, quorum business, 
added one other element, which is uh, uh, experimentally our colleague uh, Eric Usby wants a fund that a cell that is uh, a T cell that is activated by a virus can now go back and resample, but now it is kind of more sensitive and can be activated with a smaller threshold. And once we incorporated that in our model, we found that essentially we could reproduce uh, the increase in the chance of uh, autoimmunity with the, the number and duration of viral diseases. And, um, so there's an other story that I can expand upon, but maybe I'll just go to the summary given the time. So basically, uh, I introduce you to the uh, uh, adaptive immune system and uh, this innovation of having different receptors and how this uh, uh, timing selection uh, selects among those receptors, those that don't cause, uh, cause autoimmune diseases. But along the way, we find that uh, uh, they tell us something about uh, the way that specificity is uh, uh, encoded. And uh, then there is this story of the quorum and uh, how it could potentially be related to the uh, connection of viruses and uh, autoimmune diseases. And as I said, I had a whole other story about B cells that I will talk about in a bio launch seminar that is uh, a week from now. This work was inspired, most of it, by Arup Chakrabarti, who has essentially guided uh, uh, this development of thinking about uh, 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 modeling autoimmune diseases. A great collection of graduate students such as uh, Andre Kosmerlich, now a uh, professor at Princeton, all the way to young colleagues that are working with us. And I'll mention Eric Husby is the person who has been doing the experiments that have been very important in all of this. So thank you for your attention. Any further questions or comments? We have a lot here. Yeah. Okay. For the failure of T cell based immuno cancer immunotherapy, is because the cancer cells, uh, T cells, not only exposed to the antigen presented by the tumor cells, but also the handshake proteins, right? So it seemed like at least to me, I have the conception of T cells actually binding to several different kinds of receptors before they respond. So isn't that kinetic proofreading kind of response a lot more efficient than having to have a quorum of cells before you can act? Um, so what you are saying could be part of it. So what uh, I did was to say that the difference between activation of a, uh, a cell versus foreign is driven by it's having been exposed or not exposed. Now, what you're suggesting is that there could be additional controls, but then you have to explain how those additional controls are different between cell and foreign infections. If that may be the case, and the cell does all kinds of wonderful things, but I would like to sort of understand the proof reading mechanism that you mentioned, how it distinguishes cell from foreign. Your framework in the findings, right. they are exposing uh, to M, but each one is actually examined at the same time by several of them. Each uh, cell is. Each selected event is yes. by one, right? That's why right. totally set by one. Right. Okay. right. Will that change? Me? No. I don't think so.
Thanks for a very nice talk. Is it on? Is it on? Um, I'm just curious about your um, your description. Didn't include anything about mutation rate and combination rates. And how does that play into this story? Okay, um, so for T cells, all of the mutations that are actually recombinations take place in the bone marrow. And then there is really nothing that happens further. Now, if you come to the bio lunch, I will be talking about B cells. And for the B cells, there's lots and lots of point mutations that will take place in lymph nodes once you have presentation of something else. So the story of B cells is very much more reliant on mutations and stories of natural selection. Cool, right, thanks. Where is the... Uh, no, Thursday, 12th, 14th or 12th. Yeah, so um, I guess uh, um, maybe related question to what you were asking. Um, the forum argument is assuming independent that 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 you, you can treat these the things as independent events, so you can just count them um, binomially. What happens if you have correlations between them? Okay. <laughs> so this, I'm just reading this. right. So basically. Uh, I kind of here, when I show the formula, I'm assuming the independence. Yeah. So, so, so. Right, right. So when we did uh, this calculation, uh, we actually were, for computation, we were very precise. We uh, took parts of the human proteome and foreign proteome. There is a program that tells you how to load them on MHC. We did all of that. And then we calculated how likely it is for a foreign peptide to activate a number of T cells that had gone through our program. And what I, we found was that the answer was far from Poisson. That is, uh, there are some T, uh, peptides that essentially activate the entire T cell uh, story so the presentation of the probabilities that I have told you is not correct. And the reason for that is uh, that there are some peptides that happen to have strongly binding amino acids. So once you have strong binders, they will bind to many things. So there's strong correlations that are built into that that we need to take into account in order to more probably, uh, properly address this question. So, I mean, you're following this again. So you then I could imagine like a kind of two-state model. Yes. So the simplest model I would think of would be two-state model where you have essentially like strong binders and weak binders. Yes. And then you have some, so have you done that? Uh, we have done some version of that, yes. So we have essentially uh, reduced the problem uh, of the interaction energy to some number that is representative of the peptide that we are taking as a continuum that goes from weak to strong and some number that is representative of the T cell that goes from weak to strong and the binding is the sum of the two. And that reproduces this. And can be done. Any other questions? Okay, so then it's time for another lovely talk.